Hi, and welcome to this video about the role of initiation factors in the formation of the 30th initiation complex. This video will go over Table 17.1 in Robert Weaver's 5th edition Molecular Biology textbook. This video was made for MCDB 427 Molecular Biology at the University of Michigan. So before we go into detail about initiation factors in the initiation complex, let's talk about translation. Translation is the process of taking mRNA and turning it into a polypeptide that can be later folded into a protein. During translation in prokaryotes, the mRNA interacts with the 70S ribosome, amino acyl tRNAs, and a couple of other factors to produce the polypeptide. The 70S ribosome is made of two parts. The 30S ribosome, which is the small subunit, and the 50S ribosome, which is the large subunit. Although this is a nice picture, there is one thing missing. The start codon for prokaryotes is usually AUG, which usually encodes for a methionine. However, there are a couple of things that are special about this first tRNA that binds. Instead of the first amino acid just being a plain methionine, a formal group is added to this methionine and the tRNA is called f -met. Another special thing about this tRNA is that it binds to the P site, unlike the rest of the amino isolated tRNAs, which bind to the A site. One of the first things that needs to occur for translation in prokaryotes is the formation of the 30th initiation complex. Initiation factors are needed for this to happen. In prokaryotes, there are three initiation factors, IF1, IF2, and IF3. As always, in eukaryotes, this is a bit more complicated and there are more initiation factors that are needed. The 30th initiation complex consists of the 30S ribosomal subunit, mRNA, the FMET tRNA FMET, the initiation factors, and GTP. As seen in this picture on the right, the large and small subunits first have to dissociate from each other. This happens with the help of IF3, which stops the 50S subunit from rebinding. After this occurs, IF1 and IF2 can bind. IF2 comes on with GTP because it is a GTPase. Finally, mRNA and FMET tRNA combine to complete the 30S initiation complex. Waba and his colleagues wanted to figure out which of these initiation factors was most important for binding to the 30S ribosome. They did this by taking radio-labeled mRNA or FMET from three different phages and mixing the RNA with ribosomal subunits and different combinations of the initiation factors. The scientists were able to easily isolate the initiation factors from E. coli by washing the ribosomes with a one molar ammonium chloride ribosomal wash. The scientists then measured the amount of RNA binding to the ribosome subunit. For the binding assay, the scientists incubated the ribosome initiation factor mixture for 15 minutes and then measured the radioactivity of the ribosomes. Now that we got all of that out of the way, let's move on to the table. Table 17.1 actually goes over the results of three different experiments, so let's go over each experiment one at a time. The first thing they wanted to know was which initiation factor was most important for mRNA binding to the 30S ribosome. In experiment 1, they used R17 phage mRNA in both the 30S and 50S ribosome. They used both the 30S and 50 ribosomes because they didn't completely understand the mechanism of translation initiation yet. For this phage, they measured the binding of both mRNA and FMET tRNA to the 30S ribosome subunit. Our first question only is looking at mRNA binding, so let's ignore the last column for now. When IF1 and IF2 were added, only 0.4 picomole of mRNA bound to the 30S subunit. IF2 on its own mediated the binding of even less mRNA. Adding IF3 on its own actually led to a much higher ribosomal binding of 2.7 picomole. If you add IF1 on top of IF3, you get even more binding, and if you add IF2 in addition to IF3, you get about the same amount. This last row just shows that the best mRNA binding occurs when all three initiation factors are present. So the data in this column suggests that IF3 is the most important factor for mRNA binding to the 30S ribosome subunit. 
Now that the scientists knew that IF3 is the most important factor for mRNA binding, they wanted to know if this was also the case for FMET binding to the ribosome. The FMET data for this phage doesn't really tell you much. There is very little binding for all of the different reactions except for when all three initiation factors are added, so it is difficult to point out which initiation factor is the most important for FMET binding. The next two experiments are a bit more informative. In experiment two, the MS2 phage is being used, and in experiment three, the TMV phage is being used. The, the trends in these two experiments are the same. When IF1 and IF3 are added, there is basically no binding of FMET to the 30S subunit. In fact, when IF2 is added on its own, it results in more ribosomal binding compared to when the other initiation factors are combined. When you add another initiation factor to IF2, ribosomal binding increases. But like in the previous experiments, FMET binding to the 30S subunit is highest when all three initiation factors are present. So these two experiments using the MS2 and TMV phages show that IS2 is the most important initiation factor for the binding of FMET tRNA FMET to the 30S ribosome subunit. So the data from Table 17.1 gives two main results. The first experiment shows that IF3 is the most important initiation factor for mRNA binding to the 30S ribosome. The second two experiments show that IF2 is the most important initiation factor for FMET tRNA FMET binding. I hope that this video has been helpful in your understanding of prokaryotic initiation factors. Thank you so much for watching, and remember, go blue!